Good evening. I'm Steve Bowling from the University of Michigan, and we're here tonight uh, with my colleague, Neil Dougal, Assistant Professor of Anesthesia, also from the University of Michigan, and my dear friend, Joanna Chickwe, Chairman of the Department of Cardiac Surgery at Cedar sinai in LA. We're gonna have a little hallway conversation, really a case presentation uh, about imaging and mitral valve repair. And first of all, I'd like to thank Medtronics for sponsoring this. I think, you know, in this age of Zoom, it's really fantastic to do these things. And I'd like to thank all of you for being here, taking your time out of your evening or morning or wherever you are around the world to join us. And this really is supposed to be a hallway conversation via Zoom, of course. And throughout the course of the conversation, you'll see that Neil and Joe and I will be talking back and forth. And also we would like you to enter things into the chat box and we will answer those questions on the fly as we go. Let's keep this casual. So I, I think I'm gonna first talk with a little concept about what are the advances in mitral valve therapy. Let me see if my slides will work here. Really no, leave no MR behind. And what we mean by that is, you know, we used to think that it was okay to leave a little bit of mitral regurgitation, but we've really found out that it's not. So what are the advances? Well, first of all, we now understand very well that mitral volume predicts mitral repair that the more you do of something, the better it is. This was our original paper from almost 10 years ago now, where really the number of mitral repairs done per surgery in the United States is relatively low. And, and this was a very interesting study and it shows that the more you do, the better you are. That of course is not astounding new or anything like that. It's really the 10,000 hour rule and you have to do a lot of it to be good. And you know, it's not the age of the patient. It's really the surgeon volume that determines mitral valve repair. You can see in the Medicare population, it's exactly the same from this paper from Christina Vasileva. You can see it's not the hospital. It really, the surgeon effect overwhelms any hospital effect. And that's true. You're not operated by a program or a building. You're operated by a man or a woman surgeon. They are going to do your mitral valve repair. It's not the country, this effect is the same, not just in the United States, but in England. And it's not just at Michigan, it's also in other states. This is the Virginia data from Irv Clone and uh, Gaurav Alawadi, who's now here at Michigan with us. And of course, Dave Adams published the same thing with Joanna actually in New York. It's the surgeon volume. So mitral valve surgery is really very concentrated, not only just in hospitals in the United States now, but really in the hands of certain surgeons. Mitral valve repair is very concentrated. And you can see again in this paper from Jim Gammy that as your annual case volume goes up, your repair rate goes up to the point where if you're doing more than 100 repairs per year, you're basically repairing all of these mitral degenerative valves. So why is that important? Well, mitral valve volume predicts mitral repair, but why is that important in and of itself? is because mitral repair, <coughs> as opposed to mitral replacement, excuse me, restores life expectancy. I mean, really the data has always been out there. We've always had this feeling that to repair degenerative mitral regurgitation was to cure mitral regurgitation. You know, we know certainly that early repair is much better than medical treatment or watchful waiting, or whatever you wanna call it. And that mitral valve repair results in excellent long-term survival. This is Tyrone's fantastic long-term 20-year paper showing that survival is superb after mitral valve repair in degenerative disease. We took a slightly different way to look at these patients and we looked at about the last thousand routine mitral degenerative repairs we did with pretty normal function. And we said, whatever age we start them at, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, using a technique called Anderson Darling that lets you, lets you take a look at a very small population against a big population. So we basically looked at the CDC survival data for all 334 million of us. And you can see that the waterfall survival of mitral valve repair is exactly the same as if you did not have this operation. 
that if you look at the median survival of these groups of patients, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and so on like that, that the survival after mitral valve repair in these thousand patients that we did here at Michigan is exactly the same. They overlap. Mitral valve repair really is curative. So that's why mitral valve repair is so important. It restores life expectancy far more than a mitral valve replacement. Now, obviously, the survival in mitral valve replacement is better than the natural history of wide open MR, but obviously it can't approach the life expectancy of the patient. It has to be slightly lower because we've given them a sort of disease. We've put a cow valve or a pig valve in your heart. And of course, we can't put you back on that. So mitral repair restores life expectancy, but life expectancy depends on a perfect repair. You can't leave a patient with moderate mitral regurgitation after your repair and say, I'm going to put you back on your survival line. It really depends on a perfect repair. So we really have to take the philosophy of leaving no MR behind. And if you look at it, we've known that for quite a while. And this you know, paper from Rakesh Suri when he was at Mayo, you see the difference between survival, those patients who had no mitral valve recurrence and mitral valve recurrence is very large. Mitral recurrence is bad and takes you off your life expectancy curve. We've known even the difference between anything greater than zero is significant and that the freedom from postoperative MR really depends on residual MR you see on intraoperative imaging. That this is where we're going to come our talk to is how do we use intraoperative imaging to help us as uh, surgeons get that perfect repair, which when we can tell the patients, now you've hit your life expectancy. We know from this follow-up study from the Mayo Clinic that even a little MR is bad. You can see that there is a difference between no MR and having mild MR, and that over a 10-year period, it actually adds up and is cumulative for the patients. So do a perfect repair. We know that you know, residual MR at the time of operation really begets more MR. So we have to leave no MR behind. And that depends on imaging and working really hand in hand with your imager. So here's an interesting paper that we did. We looked at about 1600 uh, repairs looking at anterior and posterior. And when I was trained, we always said, well, anterior repairs are tougher. Therefore it's okay to leave one plus or even two plus anterior repairs because they're hard to do and they don't do as well long-term. And you know, that was really a miss, uh, bad thought on our part that they had a higher reoperation and they had inferior long-term survival and that was just the nature of anterior disease. So we looked at our group and we looked at 800 in both groups and what we left behind in both groups but anterior and poster was really sort of less than trivial mitral regurgitation equivalent in both groups. And in fact, you see from the data that the vast majority of these patients in the overall group and the poster group and the anterior group greater than 90% had no residual regurgitation whatsoever. And if you looked at the long-term survival, looking at anterior versus posterior repair, you can see they're exactly the same. This is an 800 patients, they're exactly the same. It wasn't anything to do with the anterior repair. It had completely due to the fact that somehow we were satisfied leaving a patient with an, after an anterior repair with one or two plus. It wasn't the anterior leaflet, it was the MR. It was really the MR. And so leave no MR behind. So how do we get that perfect repair as surgeons? Well, we have to really think, fix it how it works. I mean, the mitral valve, as we know, is not really just an upside down aortic valve. And in fact, it doesn't really work on a pressure basis. And the cords really just align the zoa of coaptation to form that keystone or that Roman arch. And it is not the cords hanging on for dear life that keeps the mitral valve closed. It is actually not that at all, but this, the zone of coaptation, that Roman arch, when pressed together under ventricular pressure, keeps the valve closed. So I think it's important to remember that, that it's a Roman arch you can see on the left. And it's really, that is what ensures good mitral closure. And whether we get to that point with method A or B or C doesn't really matter. 
here's me in Ephesus, Turkey, holding this Roman arch up that's been there for 3,000 years. Now, it was trick photography. That thing's been there for 3,000 years, and it's the keystone really at the top that holds that together. So as surgeons, we have to think of that. Let's make sure that the mitral valve forms this keystone, this Roman arch. So we need to think, we need to fix it, how it works. And so that from either side of that Roman arch, ventricular pressure pushes the mitral valve closed. Now, how to do that? Of course, should we do a triangular resection? Should we do a quadrangular resection? Should we use neocords? Well, if you look at it, whether you use neocords or triangular or quadrangular or whatever, if you look over to the right, they all sort of look the same when you're done. That's because they all form an interventricular keystone below the plane of the annulus. So let's go a few, through a few cases. This is a 72-year-old with bileaflet prolapse, EF of 65 normal coronaries. You can see looking at this echo, this patient has a very large bileaflet prolapse. You can see that the hinge point of the posterior leaflet has moved up the atrial wall or atrialization of the hinge point. I think the first thing that I do when I think about a case like this is really evaluate the valve, take a second or two, see if there's broken cords. This patient did not have them. And you can see they have a lot of tissue, a lot of tissue. So I think lots of tissue to mean equals lots of resection in this case. So I did a posterior resection. And then I sort of did a sliding plasty on this one. I undermined the posterior leaflet really to pull it backwards. Of course, in so much tissue where we, are, where we get SAM. And then I was gonna put cords into the anterior leaflet. So I put them into the papillary muscles early on because the valve is wide open. So I, I put them in early on just to get them out of the way. And this is what, the, what I use. I don't use pledges. I just use a figure eight and then put them down there. So the next thing you can do is you can take cords and move them around. Remember, this is really dealer's choice how you repair this valve because people ask me, you know, should I do it with a, you know, red stitch or a purple stitch or yellow stitch? It doesn't matter. Now, of course, we put the poster leaflet together and we see, have I missed anything? And I don't, I don't see any cords loose or anything, but I certainly do see the anterior leaflet floating up. So I always put the cords in, in once I have the ring down in the new geometry of a ring. And why did we use a ring in these patients? Well, you know, it's just math. If you look at the normal with a 60 cc stroke volume, and a good zonal co-optation, now the patient has dilated, has severe MR, and of course their total stroke volume is 120 cc's. They're not only pushing 20 cc's forward, I mean 60 cc's forward, but 60 backwards. So their ventricle has to get much larger. It pulls the annulus open, and to restore that zonal co-optation, that Roman arch, that keystone, you need to push it back together again and restore the geometry of the mitral valve. Now, if you don't, you really think of it, it's a band, a rubber band that's been broken. That annulus is now a broken rubber band and it will keep on going. So, you know, we use a ring on every single case we do of degenerative repair. The rubber band is broken and replace it with something that will hold it in that shape. What about ring annuloplasty style? Should I use a complete one or an incomplete in degenerative disease? Should I use a rigid one? Should I use a flexible one? Obviously, in FMR, I use a complete rigid ring. In DMR, degenerative, I don't think it matters. Whatever. I tend to use a flexible ring. I use a partial ring, an incomplete ring, because I see patients early in the course of their disease. I don't think there's any data to say one's better than the other, but you have to remember it's not the ring, it's the ringer. It's you committed to making that a perfect mitral repair is the difference. So the last thing I do in a repair like this is I set the cords to the level of the ring because I don't want the leaflet to come back up and I just usually tie them freehand to the level of the ring as I tighten them up. Don't make them too long, don't make them too short. Set them at the ring. And this is what the final result on this case. So you can see the Roman arches form, that the anterior and posterior leaflet are below the level of the ring, and that they're both subjected, the anterior and posterior leaflet subjected to ventricular force. And that there's no SAM as soon as systole occurs, that anterior leaflet jumps backwards. 
So let's move on now to a second case, severe MR, posterior prolapse and rupture, ejection fraction 65%, normal corner. So Neil, I'm gonna ask you to comment about this echo. What are your thoughts on this echo? Yeah, Steve, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, you know, it looks like um, bileaflet thickening probably on the spectrum of some myxomatous generation. You can see a, obviously ruptured cord there on the posterior leaflet. And you can start to see what looks like, as you alluded to, that mitralinar disjunction or that atrialization of the hinge point is beginning to occur there. Yeah. Very obvious. I don't think you need any sort of quantification here to <laughs> tell you have severe MR. <laughs> right. Now, Here's the next thing we got. We got a 3D. And I think 3D is really helpful now for surgeons. So well done 3D is I look at this and I can already begin to see what's going on. It looks like we have a couple of broken cords. And I'm thinking in my head now with the 3D, two weeks before the operation, I'm thinking maybe I'll make a triangular resection and get rid of those uh, cords. And maybe there's a cleft between P1 and P2, but I'm already thinking of my operation. What are your thoughts on that, Neil? I mean, I think that's great. I mean, as an imager, that's what our job is too, to help you figure out from a surgical planning, both preoperative and intraoperatively, how we can best assist you. And I think now with the technology being that it is with TE imaging so great, we're able to get great 3D images to help with that. Well, this is really interesting case, but look at the 3D and then look at the intraoperative. It was exactly that. There were two big broken cords on P2 and a somewhat of a cleft over there between P1 and P2. So this 3D imaging it weeks before the operation told me exactly what I was going to do. And so this is what we went ahead and do. I always put my annular plasty sutures in first now because I think that helps me with my exposure to, you know, jump it up, pull it up into my face. And you can see that there's that big piece of P2. And when I fill it up, you can see exactly what it looks like, and it looked exactly like the 3D to me. So I had thought weeks ahead of time, so I was not surprised when I walked in there because I knew exactly what was going on. So I was gonna resect, and I thought I'd do sort of a triangular resection, which I think can take care of many things. So I, I took the broken cords out, and I did a triangular resection right here. And I think it's interesting for surgeons to think that that 3D is really helpful. I try to leave as many cords as I can. I take very few cords out underneath. You don't always have to take them uh, to the ends itself. And I try to leave any attached cords in there and then I imbricate the edges together. So I tend to resect less than I used to. You can see I've left a fair bit of P2 still in there. So I know that Carpati in the early days would just take P two out completely, but now I'm leaving a lot of P2 in there and I'm imbricating or dunking it down. The stitch that I use here is a 4-0 epibond. And I tend to imbricate it down and flatten it out. And I'll usually take a stitch and turn it underneath itself to you know, quote unquote, reduce the height of the posterior leaflet. I'm taking these down. You can run it down. You can use a proline. You can use interrupteds. All of it's the same. Because you're really trying to end up with the same result, which is that zone of co-optation, that Roman arch, that keystone underneath the plane of the annulus. And then I bring it out the annulus and tie it right there. You can see I'm sizing the ring now. And in degenerative disease, and then I tied it down, I use a bigger ring. If you have a choice between a ring and one, the next size up, usually use the next size up. And so I got a very nice repair. You can see as I'm filling the ventricle, it's starting to catch on itself, the finer pressure test. Great. And this is what the post-operative repair looked like. And this is what you want it to look like, both the anterior and posterior leaflet, well beneath the plane of the annulus. No MR, no MS, and that's a good result. So I'm gonna to go to a third case. Oh, this is the final 3D result. And you can see the 3D result looks exactly like the pressure test we got in there. So I think 3D has been very helpful to us to assess what we're thinking about before the operation and then our result. And I'm gonna show you a third case that really is 
how I assessed the case and the result when I was coming off. This is a 66 year old with severe MR, bileaflet prolapse, good function, normal coronaries again. So Neil, why don't you comment about this preoperative echo? Yeah, I would kind of agree with your assessment right there. I would agree bileaflet prolapse there, predominantly more of the posterior than the anterior. You can see some thickening of that. Looks like in my eyes, a myxomatous degenerative valve. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'd be interested to see what your approach was on how you were going to repair it. Yeah. Joe, how would you fix this? Is, is Joe live right now? I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I am. <laughs> I am. So a pretty reliable strategy is a posterior leaflet resection and then reassess that anterior leaflet because sometimes the prolapse that you see at this point particularly if it's kind of just a, a broad pseudo prolapse, doesn't actually need any surgical intervention. If, you, if you've really got something impressive in the operative field, then uh, probably go text neocordy to the anterior leaflet. But oftentimes a uh, posterior leaflet resection, be it triangular or quadrangular and a true size band or ring will do the job. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Joe, that not every anterior leaflet that looks like this needs to have something done to it. And I think sometimes because the posterior leaflet's coming up, the anterior leaflet is just allowed to swing free. If you resect a little bit of posterior leaflet and then the anterior leaflet is caught, it now doesn't flail up anymore. That's an interesting way. I think you could do it that way. I think you do it with cords. I chose to do a very large band and an alfieri stitch. You can see a lot of mitral regurgitation. So I did an alfieri on this one, a primary alfieri, which I think is fine for bileaflet prolapse. And this is what I ended up with. Neil, what's going on here? That doesn't look like leave no MR behind. I, I would concur. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's hard to tell right now where we are in the post-bypass period, but we obviously look like we're de-aired, we're full, we're at least mild MR right now. And as we know, and as your data has already shown, that usually always worsens in the post-operative period when they're awake under normal afterload states. So I would advocate to return on pump and figure out how we can get this down to nothing. Right, so I was not very happy with this outcome. And what was really helpful to me was the imaging on 3D, which I saw it coming out sort of asymmetrically out to my lower left hand. And it's interesting that there's a question in the chat box and I would ask you um, to keep asking to the chat box, have I ever had a perfect saline test that you came off and it didn't look perfect when you came off? Yes, this case had a perfect saline test and it didn't look right because I think I pinwheeled this mitral valve. And you can see on this one that I actually didn't put the alfieri in the middle of the anterior leaflet versus the middle of the um, uh, poster leaflet. And it's true that what you're doing, you're testing, there's another question in the chat box, which is really good. You're testing it in diastole, not systole, and you're also testing it in a very static state. So the you know, the sailing test is not 100% foolproof. So I went back on bypass and I moved the alfieri stitch to this, which seems more symmetrical to me. And this was the re result. So there was no mitral regurgitation. And I was much happier about this. No mitral stenosis, no mitral regurgitation, and the patient did fine. So I think this is an example of imaging that can help you. And I'll, I'll sum up my little thing by saying, we have saw three cases there. One that we did with cords and a poster resection. One that we did just with a poster resection and no cords. One I did with an alfieri and then redid with an alfieri. And, you know, I could say degenerative mitral regurgitation can be cured. And that cures the DMR patient, puts them back on their survival curve, but only if we leave no MR behind. And we can really, really use imaging to help us. And I think the point that someone brought up about the saline test, it is not always perfect because it's not under full loading with the heart moving and rotating and squeezing and so on like that. And Neil's going to go ahead and, and talk to us a little bit about the image of mitral valve repair and the focus on surgery itself. Neil, thanks. Uh, thank you for that kind of introduction, Steve. And those are some great cases. And I hope that I can build on that and discuss more on the imaging of uh, mitral valve surgery, excuse me, with a focus surgery. I'm just gonna <clears throat> I think you have to request that you're got it. I'm just waiting for the I believe the slides to advance. 
So while you're trying to advance, somebody asked a question in the chat box, did I open a cleft on that last case? And that was interesting. I think I probably did. I think that cleft on P1, P2 opened up, but because I put them like this, I sort of pulled the cleft open. So I pinwheeled it and yanked that cleft open. That was a good call on whoever's looking at that echo. Sorry, Dan. Oh, that's fine. Absolutely love it. Um, so, you know, as I said, as an imager, you know, it's essential for us to develop a methodical assessment of the mitral valve. And I think it's helpful to define Carpentier's classification. In addition, as an imager, I'm focusing predominantly on the location, the characterization of the mitral regurgitation, helping assess suitability for repair, the risk of repair-related complications, and of course, the post-repair assessment. I think it's an important foundation for us today to discuss Carpentier's classification. I believe it really helps you appreciate that there's so much more to mitral regurgitation than simply the pathology of the anterior posterior leaflet. And as we know, with type 1 disease, we have normal leaflet motion um, and position, and generally it occurs in the setting of endocarditis or annual dilatation. Type 2 is associated with excessive leaflet motion, generally in the setting of a flail or a pro, excuse me, a prolapse or flail. And type 3A and 3B describe restricted leaflet motion in systole and diastole or just systole respectively. Type 3A traditionally describes rheumatic disease while type 3 describes a cardiomyopathy or a ventricular process. And generally whenever I'm examining a mitral valve, I try to focus on a top-down approach, if you will, starting with the left atrium, the annulus, leaflets, subvalvular apparatus, and lastly the left ventricle. Now, this is an image from a recent guideline paper from the American Society of Echocardiography, and I think many of us have seen images like this uh, one in the literature. Okay, Neil, I'm going to interrupt you there and say, this image is not right. The mitral valve is not straight up. Why do echo people put it there? The, mic the aortic valve is off to the side. It's not straight up. I don't like this picture. I agree with you, and I, I think that, you know, this is, and hopefully through the end of this talk, you'll see that the cut, cookie cutter approach, if you will, doesn't really always apply to every patient. But essentially, um, what we're doing here is we're using multiple angles of 2D interrogation to help us delineate what scallops of the mitral valve we're visualizing and where pathology may be present. Now, this imaging scheme, as we said, does rely on some degree of pattern recognition. Based on the omniplane angle and the adjacent structures that you see in the image, we make assumptions on what actual mitral valve scallops we're visualizing. And I think it's a better utilization of the full potential of TE to utilize 3D echo concomitantly with 2D to confirm what you're actually looking at. And let me show you what I mean. So here we have a zero degree mid-esophageal 2D views of the same patient all along the top row. And what I've done is I've progressively advanced the probe while keeping that same zero degree angle. And to ensure what actual region of the mitral valve we're interrogating with these images, I've turned on 3D and I've rotated it to a traditional surgical on fos view. And you can see those corresponding images below each 2D image. So here with absolute certainty, we can ensure that we are cutting the valve in the scallops that we had hypothesized based on our 2D image. And interestingly, in this patient, if you notice in the middle column of videos that despite still seeing the LVOT, which would make us hypothesize that we we're visualizing more of the A1P1 or that anterolateral portion of the valve, we're actually indeed cutting through the A2P2 scallops. So let me just ask you a question, Neil, because I'm just a simple surgeon from a Midwestern town, that what you're doing here is you're moving to me as a surgeon to my right-hand side or to the medial. As you're pushing the TE down the esophagus, you're moving to my right hind side at the same angle. So you're moving from lateral to medial to see where what scalp is involved. Am I correct yes. in thinking? Absolutely correct. Yep. And Great. like I said, we're using that 3D to really show that we ensure are cutting what scalps we think we are cutting. Right. And so I usually look at 0, 060 and 120 in my mind but it may not be exactly at those sites for each person. Totally agree, and that's a great segue to the next slide here. So I think just as we use the zero degree, um, it's equally important to find a true commissural view. And this can, again, be verified easily utilizing live 3D echo. And here what we've done is I've taken three different patients with their 2D and corresponding 3D images. And you'll note that the angles vary in each of these patients from 60 to 80 degrees. 
and we've ensured that we're truly commercial by utilizing that 3D echo. So again, this utilization of 3D echo allows you to relinquish that need for pattern recognition and if, again, allows you to confirm with absolute certainty what scallops you indeed are actually visualizing. I think this is very important for surgeons to think about, you know, in terms of not just um, how they did post-op, but also think about preoperative planning to think about this. This would be nice. I'm going to have to say that we have the luxury of having Neil with us, who really is a dedicated, fantastic mitral imager, and he does so much that is helpful to me in, in all our whole mitral uh, program here. Thanks, Neil. Go on, sorry. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so, um, now that we've utilized 3D Echo to confirm our 2D imaging plan is truly commercial, we can create that long axis view that you um, had spoke of earlier. And what that does now too is allows us to scan from the anterolateral scallops all the way through to the posterior mealus scallops. And I prefer to utilize 2D echo here given the better resolution. So now we've provided our surgeons with multiple key 2D views. We looked at our mid-esophageal four slash five chamber view, the commissural view, and here the long axis view. And we've ensured that there are no assumptions as to what scallops were actually visualizing each of those 2D views. So real-time 3D image acquisition, I think has been, excuse me, is significantly less time consuming than it used to be. And although 2D, 2E, excuse me, 2DT imaging is invaluable in the assessment of mitral regurgitation, I think 3D imaging should be regarded as both a complementary and confirmatory tool. And you can see that here in this 3D image below that you can nicely see a flail segment with multiple ruptured cords, and you can easily notice a likely cleft in that posterior leaflet that would prompt you to want to further interrogate that as a potential source of regurgitation. Okay, so I'm gonna hold you up there. Uh, go back, Neil, if you could, if possible. But that 3D shows a really big, deep cleft down between P1 and P2. And Joe, I'm gonna ask you a question because there's a question in the chat box about cleft closure. You know, what do the clefts do? And if we close them, do we shower curtain across that posterior leaflet? And do we raise the, you know, the uh, gradient up? My answer is that they have a side-to-side -side zone of co-optation, but I don't hesitate to close them. What are your thoughts? So I think that the clefts are important functionally. Um, when you see the valve open, I, just, I think this view that you can close them with impunity is not necessarily correct. You create this sort of parachute effect, and I think you predispose to stenosis, in, certainly in smaller valves with complete rings. And generally speaking, if you haven't done an aggressive resection that has opened up the clefts, you rarely need to close them. It's one of the advantages of doing a more limited sort of triangular resection that doesn't open up that P1, P2 and the P2, P3 cleft. I, I agree 100%. I think I don't close every cleft. I think unless uh, uh, we've done a huge resection and sort of bent a cleft open or something, I leave them alone. And I think you're absolutely right. In this day and age of more limited resection, we tend to leave the clefts alone. This one goes very deep back to the annulus, but you can imagine if you closed all the clefts all the way out, you would sort of have a shower curtain sitting across half of the valve that wouldn't bend down very well. Those clefts are there for a reason because functionally the mitral valve really acts like four leaflets bending down and gives us the biggest possible hole. So I think you know, it's okay to close clefts, but just think about why they're there. And if they're working, I wouldn't, you know, just close everything because we have a cleft. That's and, and generally that highlights the difference between a physiological cleft. It's kind of normal. The, the leaflets either side are normal. There's no restriction. There's no jet associated with it, either in terms of the echo or a visible jet lesion when you look at the valve. And that's different to a pathological cleft where you've actually got something functional going on, um, be it restriction or calcification or an abnormally thickened leaflet that's not moving. And you can see either side of it thickening, maybe a jet lesion that indicates that that cleft is pathological and you either need to resect it or close it. Really, really good point because in some of the patients who have been sort of left go too long, you'll see that cleft pull itself open and then it's been vibrating in the breeze. It'll be calcified and so on like that. Those you have to do something to. Sorry, Neil. No, it was a great discussion. I think, I mean, I think our, my point here was just to show like that, you know, utilizing 3D Echo clearly obviously shows you that cleft very easily. And like I said, 
And as Joe had already alluded to, it really needs to find out, is there any regurgitation actually coming from that cleft or is it truly physiologic? <clears throat> so um, now in the post uh, assessment of mitral valve repair, um, usually you wanna obviously assess for residual mitral regurgitation and mitral stenosis. And as uh, Steve, you had already very eloquently alluded to, anything greater than mild mitral regurgitation is gonna be associated with increased risk of reoperation and poor outcomes. And thus, in the appropriate circumstances, you want to have that discussion with your surgeon about returning on a cardiopulmonary bypass to correct this. And a similar discussion should ensue if you're concerned about mitral stenosis. And in general, under appropriate loading conditions and a heart rate, um, excuse me, an appropriate heart rate, a mean gradient of greater than six to seven prompts concern. Uh, in addition, post mitral valve repair should include assessments for new lateral wall motion abnormalities, which can occur um, with circumflex artery damage, new onset aortic insufficiency from perhaps a non or a left coronary cusp for traction, and then dynamic LVOT obstruction uh, with systolic anterior motion or SAM of the mitral valve leaflets. And some of the more common causes of residual mitral regurgitation would be uncorrected prolapse, excessive leaflet tension or torsion, uncorrected clefts leaflet perforation, perhaps also involving an aneoplasty band, and then SAM as we just spoke of. Now, <clears throat> the mechanism of post-repair SAM is obviously complex and involves both anatomic and hemodynamic factors. However, it can be eloquently explained by essentially the presence of excessive leaflet tissue to annular size. Excessive leaflet tissue, both anterior and posterior, can predispose you to SAM. In addition, a long posterior leaflet relative to the anterior leaflet really shifts that coaptation zone anteriorly into the LVOT, further increasing that risk. And some other anatomic risk factors, such as a non-enlarged annulus, basal septal hypertrophy, or a very small hyperdamic left ventricle. Now circled in yellow and in the images below are some routine measurements that we try to institute on, uh, excuse me, capture on all of our mitral valve cases. And you can see on the bottom left image, we're measuring an aortomitral angle. And one can imagine that as that angle narrows, you're gonna begin to allow that anterior leaflet to really be dragged into the LVOT. And on the bottom right image, you see us measuring the distance from leaflet coaptation to the ventricular septum, which is referred to as the CSEP distance. In addition, we're measuring the ratio of coapted leaflets, both the anterior and posterior. And you would imagine that, again, as that ratio were to decrease, that would mean that you've shifted that coaptation zone more anteriorly and increased your SAM risk. Okay, so Neil, let me ask you a question. So the three things that you've circled there is one, you got a long anterior leaflet, two, the coaptation zone is very close to the septum, and three, that aortomitral angle is very close together, meaning the aortic valve is close to the mitral valve. Those things worry me. Now, I don't see on your list the difference between a complete ring and a partial ring. Joe, what are your thoughts on that? SAM gives everybody fever. We have SAM fever. We're terrified by it. What do you think about that? Complete ring versus partial ring. Is there a difference in terms of SAM? Uh, I don't think there's a whole lot of data to say that. I think you just have to accept that you're going to need to tailor your leaflet strategy to your ring strategy. So if you're using complete rings, you really do want to do a more aggressive resection and be very careful about reducing the height and the volume of, of the leaflet tissue that you've got. And if you're using a partial ring, you can be a little bit more liberal. Um, and I certainly it's been in my experience that I saw more SAM when I was using a complete ring strategy and a heck of a lot less SAM when I use a true sized flexible bands. So I, I agree with you. And of course, we hold those opinions most fiercely, those opinions associated with no data. But I think the flexible ring may be a little bit more forgiving in that. There's a great question in the chat box. Is there a CSEP measurement that can predict SAM? Neil, I, I don't think so. But yeah, the I mean, closer that coaptation gets to the septum, the more we should think of it. Correct. I mean, I, I think you know, obviously the data would suggest less than 2.5 centimeters increases your risk. But I, I think, you know, I use sort of all this as a collective information to just help my surgeon delineate overall. If there's multiple risk factors, there's probably a higher risk than if there's fewer. Great. All right, Neil, we'll show us some cases here. You got some cases for us. Okay, excellent. So why don't we start with our first case here right now. We've got a 60-year-old female, history of breast cancer, status post mastectomies, chemo and radiation with normal coronaries. And you can see um, on the intraop imaging, we've got bileaflet thickening, likely myxomatous changes, 
unlikely a radiation-induced phagalopathy. Got a flail P2 scallop there with ruptured cords, prolapse of the P1, and some degree of some mitral calcification on that P1 scallop. And then um, on the 3D, perhaps a likely cleft in that posterior uh, scallop. So I guess I'd pause for you, um, Joe and Steve, to kind of give your thoughts. And when you're looking at this, Val, what, what's your approach? Joe, what's your thoughts? Yeah, it looks like a lovely candidate for a triangular resection of that isolate. Exactly. I would say resection. Obviously, Neil's going to tell us something nefarious is going on. Go ahead, Joe. It's Neil. I would do a triangular section in a Excellent. partial ring. Excellent. So... Um, this is, this mitral operable pair actually did neocords on the P1 and P2 scallop and was sized to a pretty large 38 millimeter simuplus band. Um, and then upon weaning from cardiopulmonary bypass and de-airing, we noted these images. Oh my. So this is a perfect day to be a heart surgeon because you started off with MR and you've ended up with MR and subaortic valvular stenosis from Sam. Great. Great. So in my mind, what size ring did they use, Neil? 38 millimeter. Okay, so that's a big ring, but obviously one of two things happened here. I mean, the first thing you have to do is, Neil, I go through in my mind, don't panic because 90% of SAM is physiologic. So slow them down, fill them up, you know, make sure they're not tachycardic. Joe, do you beta block these people? Well, I, I'm going to walk back a couple of steps because the piece of information we don't have is what did the saline test look like? And if that saline test was absolutely watertight and I'm as happy as a clam, that is SAM until it's proved otherwise, and I'm going to throw everything in the pharmacological armamentarium at that. Whereas so if this, the saline test wasn't awesome, then I want to think this through a little bit differently. So this saline test did look fine. Correct. Looked totally yeah, well fine. Then we're going to stop the inotropes, we're going to slow them right down, probably going to try a little bit of lobutolol, and uh, that'll all go away with some adequate filling. You probably came off a bit empty. That'll look very, very different in about five minutes' time. Right. So Neil, you did all that and what? And unfortunately with volume loading, beta blocking, we increased that um, map to at least 80 and still had some degree of SAM and a little bit of residual MR. And given the patient's age and their minimal comorbidities, we elected to return to carpal bypass to re-repair. I think that's a really important thing. So I was called down to this case. Absolutely, if this is a repairable valve and we all looked at it and it said this is a repairable valve, then it's still a repairable valve. And somebody asked me a question in the chat box. Good question. Is the saline test more reliable with neocords or resection? I, I think it's equally reliable or not reliable. I don't think there's a difference. But the thing not to do is not to go back on bypass and replace this valve. Okay, so Neil, what happened here? Okay, so we went back on cardiopulmonary bypass and clefts in both the posterior P2 and P3 scops were closed to really create that sort of curtain-like effect to the posterior leaflet somewhat reducing its mobility and effectively lowering that height of that posterior leaflet. In addition, the annulus um, was actually upsized to a 42 millimeter semi-plus band from the previous 38. And you can see here now that we've really shifted that posterior, I'm seeing that zone of cooptation quite posteriorly, posteriorly and don't have any residual MR or SAM. All right, good job. Let's go to the next one. You have one more, right, great. Yeah, excellent, yep. So here we've got another case, another young, 62-year-old male with atrial fibrillation, non-obstructive coronary artery disease, incidentally also had a secundum ASD and tricuspid regurgitation in addition to the MR. And you can see here on the intraoperative imaging, we've got a large dilated left atrium with bileaflet involvement, predominantly of the posterior leaflet. And we see that mitral inner disjunction of the posterior leaflet, which is traver traditionally referred to by surgeons as that neutralization of the hinge point. But essentially you can see that that posterior annulus and LA wall have separated off from the LV. So I'd pose a question again, how would you guys attack a valve like this? Joe? I think sometimes when you've got a central jets and that um, moderate degree of prolapse that an annuloplasty ring actually does address a lot of it and occasionally you actually don't need to do much to the leaflets. Um, I suspect though that you're going to want to do something to both the posterior and the anterior might be cords, you, you could do it with a triangular resection plus cords to the anterior. Right, I think there's a lot of ways to treat this now. And? And so we did um, neocords of the P2, actually closed a P2 cleft and did a, a commissural plasty of that posterior medial commissure. And then it was sized again here with a 42 millimeter semi plus band. Um, in addition, obviously closing the ASD and doing a uh, tricuspid valve and a ring. Okay. Uh, 
So now when we wean ah. the Ericocali point bypass, we know to these images. So you okay. can- Okay, so oh, I'm looking at this, Neil, and you have either <clears throat> something coming through a stitch or you actually have a tear in your leaflet up there by A1, P1, it looks like to me. Yep, so, you know, that was our suspicion. So, you know, unless you're looking at that 2D image, you can see what, what I would call right now is a lateral jet. You know, we're still filling, we're de-airing, probably gonna worsen. Um, and when we further interrogate it with 2D and 3D, it was extremely suspicious that this check could actually be involving the anoplasty band and the leaflet and possibly be a perforation. So we advocated actually to go back on pump. So Joe, would you have gone back on with this patient? Yeah, I, th I think the key thing is, is what you think is causing that leak on its own. The grade isn't enough to necessarily drive you back on pump. Yeah. But the fact that it's telling you that maybe a suture line is torn or one of your annular stitches is torn, that's what you want to go back and fix. You know, I think you're the MR here, you're fixing the pathology. Exactly right. This is mild to trivial MR, and yet you're, I'm worried about this patient with hemolysis. So I would go back on and fix this. And I bet that there was something that was found. Neil? Yep. And exactly right on point. So actually, when we went back on pump, um, we noted that there was a leak in the lateral trigone and there was actually a small tear in the muscle and the anterior leaflet that required primary closure and the trigonal suture was replaced. And then as you can see, as we weaned off coronal coronary bypass, that that concerning jet was no longer present. Great. Fantastic. Neil. I think those would be great case and a very great discussion about imaging can help us do a perfect repair. And I think, Joe, you have a few cases to bring us home with. While we're getting her uh, slides up, there's some other questions in there. You know, cords for SAM. Yeah, cords for SAM are good because the cords are posterior and they tend to limit SAM, just like an alfieri for, for SAM is pretty good. That's a good question. Um, other things, do I, when I do an alfieri, do I always put a ring in? Yeah, I always put a ring in when I do every case. I think the recurrence rate of patients who you don't put a ring in has been, I've never done a case, a degenerative case without a ring. Joe, show us I, some cases. I did one once. Ah, and, and you regretted it. Yeah, I regretted it. Yeah, right. Yeah, you, you need it. Agreed. Even if you think you don't, it looks perfect, it looks great on yeah. the echo, you, you need a ring. Yeah, agreed. So I was asked to share some uh, second clamp cases and I have no relevant disclosures. And what I wanted to cover is sort of the why and the how. Um, this is our series, which is essentially comparing Patients with degenerative mitral regurge that had repairs that left the OR with one plus MR miles versus their survival if they left the OR with none. And clearly there'll be a little bit of a selection bias because the patients that you aggressively go back and reclamp are the ones whose aortas or comorbidities you're not as concerned about. It's probably going to be the younger patients. You really want to get a perfect result. Um, but you can also sense that e even mild uh, residual MR has an impact. Um, on the survival after degenerative repair. So that's really the drive of the rationale. And what you see in the OR isn't generally going to get better. It's, it's only going to get worse. So we're trying to save these patients from moderate and severe MR. So this, this first case is a 67-year-old um, uh, patient with AFib, preserved EF, symptomatic, severe MR uh, with a P2 prolapse, um, which you'll see on the pre-bypass uh, transesophageal echo. It's got non-obstructive coronary disease. Um, any thoughts? So this looks like a really nice uh, posterior repair. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. And you're gonna see a, a, a two rookie mistakes in this. <laughs> yeah, so there's the broken cord you're holding it right there. Yeah. So I'd probably resect that. Looks like that's what you're doing. Yeah, and you can see sort of a fairly cursory inspection of the anterior leaflet, which essentially looked normal, nice and mobile, not prolapsing. Um, and this is really sort of highlighting the error of getting completely focused on one piece of pathology and not recalling exactly what you'd seen on the echo and the rest of your valve inspection. So it's, it's a relatively straightforward triangular resection. This first stitch makes all of the difference. I'm sort of imbricating, keeping that carpetation line super, super smooth. I think that really helps avoid residual um, MR and it's a true size uh, simplex annuloplasty band, um, which again is we've talked about how 
certainly in my practice, I've sort of seen much, much less SAM with it. It seems to give a, a sort of really nice result with these um, slightly less aggressive resection type repairs. So it allows you to do a triangular resection for most pathology with um, really great freedom from residual MR. And the saline test, all I'm looking for is not too much by way of residual prolapse. And just to get, get a sense of the competency, which I think looked fairly respectable. It's not a great view because we take the retractor out. You need to do that if you're using a flexible band. Um, but this is the MR that we came off with. So I'm curious uh, what the folks think about that. I'm just going to pause it. So I can tell you that if we came off and Neil was in my room, and he almost always is, he would not be happy with me. And I think we try to think about what the mechanism is going on. Neil, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I would agree with that. It's an interesting appearing jet because it pours that there's a sort of a central anticentric component, which makes me wonder, you know, is there some residual prolapse or did we open up some other cleft or something like that that has changed the nature of the mitral regurgitation? Exactly. Th that's what my thought is. This is not that you didn't fix what you went there to fix. Is this something else? And when you say residual prolapse, Neil, how, how would you help the team sort of figure out where to focus on when they go back in and look at that valve? So I, you know, I think from my perspective, what I'd really want to do is really find that true commissural cut that we had spoken of earlier. Because I think when you find that commissural cut, then I can really cut and build an X plane from there, which is your long axis view, and really try to see what specific scallops that residual prolapse is still involving. Obviously, you've eloquently shown us you've addressed that flail on that P3 portion. So is there something most likely on the lateral portion, perhaps from there, that is has residual prolapse? Yeah, so I, I think that an, a great echo um, advice is super helpful, super important. It guides you, it focuses you. In lieu of that, it's really your original valve inspection. And I think the answer was there and we just jumped past it when we saw the flail. So if I take you back to the original valve inspection, look at that. That's what needed treatment and not just that flail cordy. So essentially, instead of doing a repeat triangular resection, um, I put two Gore-Tex neocords on that and we'll see the echo in a tick. And then I said that there was not one, but two rookie maneuvers here um, that were regretful. Here's the second one. So we, uh, we've now re-repaired the valve. We take the clamp off and there's a, a bit more dark blood from behind the aorta than we'd like. And that's the chitwood clamp that's pokes a hole in this uh, patient's PA. And I think for those out there that are um, contemplating minimally invasive approaches, um, this is one of the downsides of using that chitwood clamp. And I think a sort of ability to adapt and treat problems like this so that you don't have to necessarily convert to a stenotomy are really key. But that was uh, two of those sort of not, not enjoyable moments on a case that would otherwise have been quite straightforward. And I think hopefully we've got the post bypass T on that patient, which is exactly the result. Um, so that was that was a great case. And that's certainly worth doing a second clamp, even though sometimes we poke the order or something. I, I have, you have another case, great. Yeah, one more quick one. I've got great. two quick ones if you've got time. So this one is uh, on, on the pre bypass T. It's a, it's a um, nice degree of anterior leaflet prolapse. So thoughts on how you tackle this one. So, is that an anterior flail there? Yep. So I would certainly put cords on it, unless it's very far over to the A3, P3, then I might just pinch the commissure, a magic stitch as David Adams calls it or something like that. But it seems like it probably would take a cord. And then, you know, I think the posterior leaflet would probably need something to it too. So I'm done to it. And then I put a ring on. Okay, so what somebody, do... somebody asked a question about cords. Would you put them to both leaflets? Yeah, I'd put them to both anterior and posterior. And where would you put them? The rules I have about Gore-Tex is you could put as many in as you like, but don't cross the midline with a Gore-Tex and don't cross a Gore-Tex with a Gore-Tex. And I think you... this is, um, speaks to the previous case. You may already be getting a sense of pathology that's we've successfully addressed, but maybe some pathology that we haven't addressed that's gonna cause us a little challenge when, when, once the clamp comes off. And I think that's one, one of the challenges with an anterior leaflet prolapse that you treat with cords is really understanding quite how um, much you do need to support that actually very large um, area of carptation. So let's advance in the interests of time. We got actually had quite a respectable saline test with a bunch of cords and uh, a true sized ring. Here's a question for you, Joe. How hard do you fill the ventricle up when you want to do the saline test? Do you really it, distend it or? 
I would say the more confident I was with the repair, the less hard I'm trying to fill it up. I just want to see that there's no uh, prolapse. If I'm really concerned, then yes, it's going to get three or four. And I really want to see that um, valve sort of sucked down as the ventricle expands. That gives you sort of a, a nice fuzzy feeling. Um, and it, I know exactly what you mean. You want to see that valve sit down on itself as you fill the ventricle. And as you can see from this 3D, you didn't see it so well on the 2D, but the 3D actually had this you know, jet of MR that was really not acceptable. And again, the issue was this was well supported with the Gore-Tex cords. That area was not. So we went back, clamped, put a couple of magic stooches in that um, anterolateral commissure, and then you got a much, much better result on, nice. on the post bypass. And then one, we got time for one last one. This is a 68 year old. Yeah, we do great. All right, 68 year old who essentially presents after a mitra clip, which was placed two months prior with residual moderate to severe MR. Um, she's got a 60% EF. The pathology looks like it's functional. Um, and now she's got stenosis on top of her MR um, with non-obstructive coronary disease. So what are your thoughts um, just reading that uh, without necessarily seeing so, it? So as you it? know, the data from this shows that repairing a valve after a mitral clip is fraught with difficulty and the overall repair rate is 3% after mitral clip. Now this one's only been there two months, but really I think you're gonna see a lot of inflammation. I would, I would be very mm, low threshold to replace this one. Yeah, and I think that echo also shows you what you're seeing now in the field. I mean, there's, there's not a huge amount of valve tissue to play with. I mean, it's yeah. very nice to see this anterior leaflet. I was uh, encouraged by the fact she's got a relatively mobile anterior leaflet. And yep. the, the trick is, is trying to get these um, mitra clips off the posterior leaflet without really damaging it. And I don't know if this view is as pixelated for you as it is for me, but it, hopefully this gives you a sense that very sort of careful, blunt, sharp dissection you can get these out, but then the assessment is what have I got left to repair with? And I think if I was doing a do-over and I really wanted to repair this, I would probably have done a patch augmentation to that posterior leaflet, which is still obviously restricted and problematic. Um, instead of which, I thought, you know what, I, I'm going to resect that area that's um, been damaged by the clip. Hopefully there'll be enough if I bring it together with a ring and uh, it was a Actually, bit of, of optimism yeah. over reality. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you that I've taken a lot of failed clips to the operating room and my repair rate on the failed clip is zero. Yeah, and I, my take home from this was that if it's not degenerative pathology, it, it's, it's probably zero. So the ones that you can re-repair are the degenerative ones where they just really missed the prolapse. Um, those are repairable, but these, the, the functional ones that have ended up with a stenosis as well, really not recovered because you just don't have the tissue to play with. And on this first saline test, um, it, it's very unencouraging. After a few more stitches, the saline test gets a little bit more encouraging. So I, I kind of thought, well, you know, maybe this will be the, the one that proves the rule wrong. Neil, you and I have done a lot of mitral clips together and we've also done a fair number of taking mitral clips out. What are your thoughts on this case? I would agree. I mean, I, as you kind of alluded to right now, my concerns would be valve area, residual tissue that's that's acceptable to work with. And perhaps I'd even pose the question, of, you know, in the era of valve and valve technologies and such that perhaps having that perfect replacement with a, another percutaneous replacement option in the future, that maybe perhaps that's a better active valor than trying to re-repair or trying to, excuse me, repair a, a failed mitral clip. Yeah, and this is one of those examples where I really did try the saline test, but this is what we came off with. Yeah, it really looks to me on this echo, and Neil, please comment that you just couldn't get the poster leaflet to stand up and form a zonal coefficient. It's not forming that Roman arch against the anterior leaflet. I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. So, leaflet to work with. so that was the end of that. <laughs> <Replaced it. laughs> that's a great case. So I think that's okay, a really you. interesting case. Yeah, Neil, there's a. Um, so there's a question in the chat box, Joanne, what ring do you use there? Was that a simulus ring? Um, yes, that was yeah. the electronic simulus ring. Which... So I think we all sort of use uh, partial rings, simulus ring and something like that. And then we're sort of wrapping up on time here. Neil, I'm gonna ask you one last question that came in the chat box, really interesting. Like, what is the long-term difference between a patient who comes off with a mitral gradient of two and one that's four or five, vis-a-vis -vis maybe I've closed some clefts and it's a little higher? My, I don't know that there's any data. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, no, I would agree. I, I think usually I don't really, I'm not starting to get concerned until we're sort of in the five to six range. 
I think also um, what I've done routinely in the operating room is when I've when my sort of spider sense is kind of perked up a little bit, I'll try to use the 3D and you've seen me do this times and really planimeter and really get a sense of what the actual valve air really is. Because all these parameters that we use, mean gradients, pressure half times, all these PISA calculations are obviously not meant in post repair and in usually rheumatic and have fraught with many other uh, potential limitations in um, loading conditions. So I think trying to get a planimeter valve air really helps me sort of have a sigh of relief when I see a valve air that's, um, uh, that's really favorable. Joanne, what are your thoughts on that? Let's say you come off of the gradient of five. Are you okay with that? Well, expand. So, okay, uh, that's, a, that's actually a fair question. So you have to, the patient, you know, if it's a 92 year old and you don't want to go back on bypass, I think that's probably okay. And I, I think in general, you have to think of the patient. If you, your choice is to go back on bypass and put a bioprosthesis in or a mechanical prosthesis, you're going to have a gradient of five anyway. So I'm pretty happy to leave that kind of thing, depending on patient factors. Yeah, it's, I, I think you're very reliant on the echocardiographic support because that's such a, it can be such a judgment call as you come off, depending on you filling your inotropes, et cetera. And genuinely, if you've put in a decent sized ring, um, you didn't close com um, the, the commishes, it's very difficult to believe that you'd have anything that's a significant enough gradient to justify going back on to replace. I think that's a great, them. great point. And I think we're gonna wrap it up here in terms of time. I'd like to thank, uh, Joanna Chikwi and Neil Dougal for uh, discussing. I thought it was fantastic. I enjoyed it a lot. I learned a lot. I'd also like to thank Medtronics and all of you for joining us tonight for this ha hallway conversation about imaging and mitral valve repair. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you.